the Lord in prayer uh, before we begin Bible study and ask God to bless the time that we have together. Um, there are, um, again, continue to pray for our nation, continue to pray for our leaders, um, pray for those who, uh, uh, who are sick. Uh, remember Sister Janet in your prayers. I talked to her the other day and she's not feeling well, so uh, let's pray for her. Uh, nothing to do with coronavirus, <laughs> by the way. Um, pray for me. I go to my post op um, appointment tomorrow. Pray that everything is fine there um, with my knee. And I certainly appreciate your prayers. Um, and let's continue to remember uh, Sharon Beck in your prayers as well. That God would touch her and heal her um, and uh, be with that family. And pray for Sister Dale. Uh, it's a loss of her brother-in-law. For those of you who may not have heard that yet, uh, pray for her and that family as we go before the Lord in prayer today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We praise you for another opportunity to gather together again tonight, Lord, and to, uh, to learn from your word and to uh, bless your name. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, move in each, each uh, prayer request tonight, Lord, that you would touch each one who is not feeling well tonight, Lord, touch Sister Janet and her body, Lord. We can continue to touch Sharon, Lord, and, and heal her body, Lord. I pray for uh, those family members, Lord, that you continue to give them peace and comfort in this time, Lord. For Sister Dale and her family, continue to give them peace and comfort as well. Lord, we thank you, Father, that you continue uh, to move and you continue to bless each and every one. And Lord, I pray that you would... Uh, that you would move, uh, Father, in each one that, that has a need tonight, Lord, as we study your word tonight, as we uh, glean from it, Lord, I pray that you can help us to get something out of what we're learning tonight, and Lord, that it can apply to our lives, Lord, we praise you, we thank you for what you're doing, and what you're going to do here tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray, amen, and amen. Well, on Sunday nights, as I said before, we, we do uh, Bible studies, and uh, so a lot of times it's not necessarily a sermon, but we're studying a passage of Scripture or maybe even a topic in Scripture. Um, here we have really began from the beginning, from Genesis 1, and we have um, began to look at each Sunday night um, different ways. There have been some Sunday nights we've diverted from that. But we're trying to look at ways that Jesus is shown even in the Old Testament. And so uh, last time we were together on a Sunday night, we talked about um, Jacob wrestling with God. Um, and we talked about some, the significance of that. And, and we've been um, looking at different theophanies of, of Jesus. And that's Jesus, uh, that it appears that he's appearing in the Old Testament and we've seen several of them already in Genesis. Uh, tonight, we're going to focus on um, the life of Joseph. And we're going to look at uh, some of the things that he did that showed us that he, was a, he could have been a type of Jesus. Um, and how there are things in his life that correlated with Jesus. It's almost um, too coincidental. For it not to be God showing us who Jesus is through the life of, of Joseph. Um, and so we're going to look at a few of those things tonight. Again, um, and tonight, so tonight will be more like a Bible study. Um, we're, we're looking at these different things and hopefully we can draw some things out of this um, that we need. Those of you who are watching live, if you have questions um, or if you have comments, feel free to type those and uh, we'll address them as they come. Um, but so we're not looking at any particular passage of scripture, but we'll look at a lot of scripture tonight and you'll see some of those scriptures up on the board, um, uh, as we go. Um, but let's look at, uh, the life of Joseph and what a wonderful, what a wonderful life it was, um, for Joseph. Um, a lot of hard times, but it's such a good story of what it is to come from the lowest of lows to the highest of highs. He was a man that came, that, that went from being a prisoner to a prince. 
He was a man that became, went from being very favored in his household to being the lowest as a slave and then becoming the second in charge uh, of Egypt. It, it, is amazing sto- it is an amazing story, the story of Joseph. That can be found in Genesis 37 through 45. If you want to go back and read that later, read the entirety of the story. But we're going to hit on a lot of these things tonight. Uh, we're going to hit on a lot of these, um, a lot of the, a lot of the areas of his story and some of the main points of his story tonight as we begin to uh, um, unravel um, the similarities between Joseph and Jesus. Um, so let's look at the first one that I see. The first one that I see is both of them had a miracle birth. Now, you might not see Joseph as having a miracle birth. I mean, I've, in my research and, and, and studying this topic, I've seen a lot of different things where people have had charts and, and, and things where they showed the similarities. And some of them, to be honest with you, I think is a bit of a stretch um, because you could, you could, if you do that enough, you could put two different people and, and show a lot of similarities between those two people. But I think one of the similarities we do see in the life of Joseph to the life of Jesus is the miracle birth. Joseph was the firstborn son of Rachel. He was, he was the wife that in Rachel was this wife that Jacob had held most dear. He was the one that Jacob, if you remember that story, that Jacob wanted more than Leah. And he actually worked 14 years to get Rachel. Um, And so this is the one that he held dear, but Rachel was barren. Rachel couldn't have any children. Leah continued to have child after child. She had a daughter, but she also had six sons. And here's Rachel with no children. She's barren. And then in Genesis chapter 30, it tells us that God remembered Rachel and God hearkened to her and opened her womb. And she conceived and bare a son and said, God hath taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph. And said, the Lord shall add to me another son. Joseph was the result of a miracle from God. He took a woman who was not able to have children and allowed her to have a child. And, and because of that, Jacob was, allowed, was, was, uh, was fortunate enough to have a son through the wife that he loved the most. And Rachel, um, and Rachel bore the son and called him Joseph. And Joseph would end up being the one who would be the heir to, to Jacob. And so then we see in Matthew 1, and we know that already, but behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Although these circumstances were much different, the birth of Jesus was definitely a miracle. This was, the, this was even more so because what happened to Mary has never happened before or happened since. It was a virgin birth, this miraculous birth. Now, you'll get people that, um, that don't believe in, in, in Christ. You get atheists that talk about how this is false and this could never happen. You're right. It could never happen unless there was a miracle. The whole, the whole thing about this is that it was a miracle from God. And so that argument is, it, 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 it's not, it's, it doesn't hold water because it, it, this is a miracle. And that's what God does. He does miracles. And if he is the son of God, he can do whatever he wants. So we see that similarity in Joseph and, and, and Jesus, that they both were born from a miracle birth. The next thing that, that I want to point out is that his father showed him favor. In Genesis 37 and 3, now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. Why is that significant? Because this coat was prestigious. This coat was a symbol of honor and rank that was to only be worn by the heir. Joseph inherited the birthright. Now, Jacob had several other sons before Joseph was born, but Joseph chose to make the one that was born 
from Rachel being his birthright, the firstborn from Rachel. Rachel would go on to have another son, Benjamin, later on, but Joseph being the firstborn from Rachel, he would, he would obtain the birthright. The scripture tells us in Matthew 3, 17, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Just like Joseph found favor in the sight of his father, Jesus found favor in the sight of his father. He is his beloved son. He is well pleased with him. And if Jesus, what does this mean to us? If Jesus had favor with God because he was the son of God, what does that mean for those of us who are sons and daughters of God now? What does that mean for those of us who are led by the spirit of God and are adopted by God? In Romans, according to Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8 tells us the spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so, be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. If he has favor, then we have favor. If, we, if, if Christ has found favor with God, then we have adopted that same heir. So whatever he has, we have. Whatever he's blessed with, we have. Whatever Jesus, the power that Jesus has is the same power that we have today. Because the same spirit that led and directed him, the same spirit that gave him that power is the same spirit that we have today. Jesus was favored and because he was favored, we were favored. And to go along with that, Everything that Joseph put his hands to prospered. The Bible tells us that Joseph, after he was sold into slavery, and most of you know the story, so we don't have to go through that, but his brother sold him into slavery, and after he was sold into slavery, he went into Potiphar's house. And in Genesis 39 and 3, it says, His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Everything he put his hands to, he prospered in. Everything he touched, as the saying goes, turned to gold. Everything that Joseph got involved in, he couldn't help but be blessed when he was. Even in the bad times, even when things didn't look right from the outside, God was working things out for his good. Isaiah 53, 10 says of Jesus, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. That last part of that verse is, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And Jesus was prosperous. Because he was blessed of God. He was the son of God. And if we are joint heirs with him, then we will prosper too. Third John chapter verse 2 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. Now our soul has to prosper first. We have to draw closer to God. If we draw closer to God, then he's going to bless us. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to have all the money in the world. I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel. I don't believe that everybody is it's ordained by God that every every one of his children should have all should should be rich and should be prosperous in that way. But we prosper because we have that peace within. We prosper because we have that joy. We prosper because we are living we are living a life where we, we can walk in confidence and in faith knowing that our Heavenly Father is taking care of us. They both were mocked by their own people. As I just talked about, Joseph's brothers were, were uh, uh, he was mocked by his brothers and his brothers didn't like him. And to some degree, rightfully so. I, a lot of us wouldn't take um, too kindly to a brother who's telling us that we're going to bow down to him and we're going to worship him. Um, that that was the type of thing that Joseph did. And he was the one that was favored by his father. So uh, in some senses, I, I don't blame his brothers for, for not liking him, but they his own people mocked him. And we know that Jesus, his own, his own Jewish people mocked him and despised him and didn't like him. Um, and even his own brother really didn't like him and didn't really believe what was going on until later, until after his resurrection. They both were sold for pieces of silver. Genesis 37, 28 said that, jo that Joseph had, was sold for 20 pieces of silver. At the time, that was the going rate for slaves. They were sold for 20 pieces of silver. Now, because of inflation, by Matthew 26, 
Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went unto the chief priests and said unto them, What will you give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. They were both sold for pieces of silver. The only difference is Joseph was sold for 20, Jesus was sold for 30. They were both despised that much that they were sold to other people. They were given over to other people. And they were both given over to the Gentiles. Joseph was, was given to the Egyptians. Jesus was eventually given over to the Roman authorities to do with him as they wished. They were both stripped of their robe. Genesis 37 and 23. And it came to pass when Joseph was coming to his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. So this is when the brothers did it. Matter of fact, Joseph was stripped twice. Um, Joseph was stripped by his brothers, but he was also stripped by Potiphar's wife. When Potiphar's wife um, was, was trying to lie with with Joseph and Joseph was trying to get away to get away. You remember he she grabbed his his robe and, and pulled his robe off as he went to run away. But the Mark 15 24 tells us that Jesus was stripped of his clothing clothing when he was crucified. When they crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them. But every man should take. It's a great humiliation to be stripped down. It's a great humiliation to be brought to that level. And Jesus and Joseph both were, had to do, go through that pain, had to go through that struggle to get to where God wanted them to be. Jesus to, to, to be crucified and to give his life for us and took that shame upon him for us. Joseph had to go through that shame to get where God wanted him to be. And we've got to remember that as Christian people that sometimes we think God is supposed to direct our, when God directs our past, that means everything is going to go right. And that we're not going to have to go through struggles and we're not going to have to go through pain. But let me remind you, there's, there's example after example in the scripture and Joseph is just one of them that of people who had to go through trials and tribulations to get to where God wanted them to be. It wasn't a punishment for them, but it was almost, it almost seems that it's almost a requirement for the anointing of God for, for men and women to go through bad things because how would you know how good God is unless you knew how God that could bring you out of the bad times? And then the Bible tells us that, that Joseph, after they stripped him of his clothes, he was thrown into a pit. Genesis 37 says they took him and cast him into a pit and the pit was empty and there was no water in it. As he was thrown into a pit, he was held there until they would, they would um, uh, sell him into slavery. In Matthew chapter 12, it tells us that Jesus was thrown into a pit of his own. Um, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus was thrown into the heart of the earth. He was thrown into a tomb. He was thrown into a tomb to be there for three days. But I'm so glad, just as, just as it tells us in, um, in Joseph's story, that the pit that Joseph was thrown into was empty. The tomb where they placed Jesus' tomb was empty, and it's still empty. He is alive, and I'm glad he's alive today. I'm glad he's resurrected. I'm glad the tomb is empty today, and we serve a risen Savior. He's alive. We're going to celebrate that in a couple of weeks, but that should be something that we should celebrate every day as Christian people. We should be, we should be thankful and worship him because he's not a dead Savior. He's alive, alive forevermore. Both of them were falsely accused. In Genesis 39, I told you the story, or I told you a little bit of the story of Potiphar's wife, but after she had ripped him of his clothes when he was running away, this is the story that she said. She spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came into, unto me to mock me, and it came to pass as I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled out. She lied. She was saying that he took his garment off. Because he was trying to, to rape her. He was trying to lie with her. But that wasn't the case at all. He was trying to get away from her. And she's the one that took his off. But to, to save her own self, she falsely accused him. 
And we know in Mark chapter 14 that Jesus was falsely accused as well. It says, And the chief priests and all the council sought for witness against Jesus to put him to death and found none. For many bear false witness against him, but their witness agreed not together. And there arose certain and bear false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy the temple that is made with hands. And within three days, I will build another made without hands. But neither so did their witness agree together. They bear false witness of, of Joseph. They bar, bear false witness of Jesus. They accuse him falsely. And I, and I would dare to um, say that if you're watching this and if you're, if you're here tonight, there's been a point in your life at some point somewhere that someone has bared false witness on you. Someone has said something about you that wasn't true. Someone had accused you of something that you didn't do. But, but sometimes we have to go through those moments to make us stronger. Sometimes we have to go through those moments and, and know that God is going to bring us through and he's going to bring everything to light in the end. And we could fight those things. We could fight those battles. And there are times that God will release us to do that. But most of the time he tells us to be silent. That's a hard thing to do. I can tell you, it's a hard thing for me to do. When I'm falsely accused, it's hard for me to keep my mouth shut. But there are times when we have to keep our mouth shut and allow God to handle it, allow God to work it out. He says, vengeance is mine, and we allow him to do what he needs to do um, to correct uh, what's going on. And then another similarity between Joseph and Jesus is that when Joseph was thrown into prison, there were two prisoners in there with him. In Genesis 40, it tells us the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them and he served them and they continued to season inward and they dreamed a dream, both of them. Each man is dreaming one night, each man according to interpretation of his dream, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, which were bound in the prison. And a lot of you know that story, but those dreams told who was innocent and who was guilty. And Joseph found by the interpretation of the dream that the butler was innocent and the baker was guilty. Matthew 27 and 38, then there were two thieves crucified with him, speaking of Jesus, one on the right hand and another on the left. Both stories, one would find redemption and the other would only find death. In both of these stories, the two prisoners and the two thieves on the cross, one would find redemption and one would find death. In Joseph's story, the butler was restored, but the baker was executed. In Jesus' story, one of the thieves experienced eternal death, while the other received eternal life. Let's look at that in Luke 23. And one of the malefactors, which was hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answered and rebuked him, saying, Dost, thou, dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou cometh into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Two thieves with the same opportunity. One decided to squander that opportunity. One didn't have enough spiritual sight to see who this man was. One, one chose to use his dying words to mock the Son of God. But one chose in those final words just to say, Jesus, would you remember me? Would you remember me? Today you shall be with me, Jesus would tell him. You'll be with me in paradise. You're going to be with me. It, it's never too late. It's never too late to turn our eyes back to Jesus. You've never gone too far. Talked about it this morning, but you've never gone too far that Jesus can't bring you back. Even this thief on the cross. I preached a sermon one time about the fact that he says, remember me. And a member of your body. And it's almost like he was telling Jesus, and you could translate it that way, that he was telling Jesus to put me back together. I'm broken. Put me back together. You're never so broken that he can't put you back together. Then we see that Joseph and Jesus both and, 
in some senses of the phrase would be the suffering servant. In Genesis 40, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. But in the middle of being a suffering servant, in the middle of that, he was exalted. Thou shalt be over my house, Pharaoh would tell him. According unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee of over all the land of Egypt. Joseph became second in command. God had taken him from a prisoner to a prince. He had taken him from being a slave to now being the second ruler of the kingdom. He went from humbling himself as a prisoner to now being exalted to a position where the Egyptians would bow at his feet. What a miraculous story. What a story of, of, of God's favor on a man's life to see that when we really put our trust in God, when we really keep our eyes set on God, when we really trust in him, that God can bring us to places that we never thought we would be. God can make our dreams come true if we'll trust in him, if we'll rely on him. Joseph could have tried to make his dreams come true. He could have tried to do things his own way, but he just trusted God in the circumstances he was in. And he kept using the gifts that God had given him, the gift of interpretation. He kept using those gifts. He kept working and doing what God had called him to do. And because of that, he continued to prosper in everything that he did. Philippians 2 tells us about Jesus and how he was that suffering servant and he became exalted. Verses 8 through 11 tells us, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and gave him a name which is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. They thought he was down for the count, but our Lord has risen and he is victorious. His name is exalted above every name. Jesus was a man that said there was no, there was, there was nothing about him that would cause you to want to look upon his face. There was nothing about him that, that, that showed anything different physically. But, but he had to humble himself. A man, he, uh, the son of God who came from heaven and came down to earth, but had to lower himself and humble himself here on this earth. And he became, because he did, and because he was obedient to the father, God exalted him. Thank God that he's exalted. Thank God that he's exalted. And we should do everything we can to exalt him even more, to worship him even more, to lift up his name even more. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. I don't care who you are watching this, there's going to come a day, whether you do it now or you do it later, that you're going to bow to the name of Jesus. You might as well do it now. You better do it now. I'll just say it like that. You better do it now. You're going to feel a whole lot better about it if you do it now rather than wait till then. I can assure you. Both of them provided food for the hungry. Genesis 41, 57 tells us how G J Joseph did that. He, the dream that he interpreted um, for Pharaoh said that he was, that they were going to go through a famine they were going to go through seven good years, but then through seven bad years. And through that seven good years, that they were, he was supposed to store things up. And Joseph was going to help him store things up so that they would be ready for those seven years, seven bad years. And the famine in Genesis 41, it says, And the famine was all over the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold them to the Egyptians. And the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. Joseph was in the middle of a famine. People came from all around to get food, all around Egypt. They came to get food from the storehouses. And I believe today there's a spiritual famine throughout this world that has taken place. 
There are many who are hungry for something that will satisfy. There is people that are looking for something. They're hungry and thirsting for something more than what they have. But there is a prince. This time his name's not Joseph. His name is Jesus who is providing spiritual food. He is the prince of peace, but he's also the bread of life. John 6, 35 tells us, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Are you hungry for more tonight? Are you thirsty for more? David said, As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longest after thee. Are you that thirsty tonight? Are you that hungry for what God, for what Jesus has for you tonight? He's providing everything you need. You just have to come to him and drink. You just have to come and eat from the bread of life. And we're going to look at one last thing tonight. That they were both in the end known unto their brethren. Now for this, for Jesus, we're going to have to look full to the future. But right now, for, for Joseph, we'll look at Genesis 45. His brothers came to get food. His father sent, him, sent them to come get food. They had no idea who Joseph was. They went through a series of things, and Joseph really just trying to get Benjamin to come back and trying to get his dad to come back. And, and finally, Joseph has a point where he had to make himself known unto his brethren. And Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. And he cried, because every man to go, calls every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud. Catch that. He wept aloud. If anybody ought to be weeping, it should be them. But Joseph had forgiven his brothers. Joseph had decided that he was going to forgive them. And I believe long before this moment, Joseph had forgiven his brothers for what they had done. It might have had a lot to do with Joseph's prosperity that he didn't hold that unforgiveness in. The Bible says he wept aloud and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Does my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him for they were troubled at his presence. They trembled at his presence. They were scared in his presence because they knew who he was now. They knew he was Joseph and they thought he was coming with judgment. They, they knew they deserved judgment. They knew they deserved the punishment for what they had done to him. But all that Joseph had available for them was mercy. He showed them mercy. Even though they had denied him, even though they had, they had persecuted him, even though they had sold him into slavery, Joseph showed forgiveness in this moment. Are there people that you need to forgive tonight? Are there people that you need to, uh, that you need to uh, go back to and ask them to forgive you? Are there people that have done you wrong and you're holding on to those things when God is, God is begging you to let them go so that he can heal your heart, he can heal your soul, that he can transform you completely? At the end of this age, Jesus will make himself known to his brethren. Those of the house of Israel, those who rejected him, those who called for his crucifixion, those who had widely rejected him throughout the century since. Many of these will turn to him and receive him. They will repent and finally receive their Messiah at his second coming. Zechariah 12.10 prophesies about that day to come and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications 
and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is bitterness for his firstborn. Why are they mourning? Why are they showing this, this, these signs of, of, of despair in that moment? Because when Jesus is revealed to them and they finally recognize that he was their Messiah all along when the Jewish people and even this world in general, even the Gentiles that have rejected him, when they finally realize that this is Jesus, this is the Messiah that they have waited for all this time when they realize who he is and he makes himself fully known to them again, they're going to feel sorrow in their hearts that they didn't receive him before now. And the people that went before him, for before them, didn't receive him then. But the one who had been rejected and cast aside will still look on his brethren with love. Just as Joseph looked on his brethren with love and with mercy, he's still going to look on them with love and mercy. They deserve wrath, but he will extend his arms of mercy toward them that will repent and receive him. I'm so glad that Jesus, although he should have, he did not reject me. In the midst of all the times that I've denied him with my actions, with my words of, of all the times that I've turned my back on him in sin and done things that I shouldn't have done. Of all the times that I've hurt him and drove the nails in again, as the song says. I, 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 and all the times that I've disappointed him, I'm so glad that he still shows me love like a prodigal son coming back. To the Father. I'm so glad that his arms are extended, waiting to receive me again. Just as Joseph received his brothers, I'm so glad Jesus is receiving his brothers and sisters again with mercy and with grace. Aren't you glad about that tonight? Aren't you glad that you could have been rejected? You could have been turned away, but we serve a loving God full of mercy and full of grace. We have a reason to give him glory tonight. We have a reason to give him praise. We have a reason to lift up his name tonight because he has showed us so much love because he is a God of grace and a God of mercy. We thank God for that. Father, we thank you tonight. We praise you tonight. For all those who are in attendance, Lord, through social media, all those who are in attendance here, we pray that you would bless each one tonight. Remind us again of how grateful we should be that we serve a God who loved us enough that he continues to show us mercy and grace. Father, we know that means that we shouldn't abuse your grace. We shouldn't keep on doing the things that we used to do, but we should turn our backs on that. We should repent and keep moving forward. But all of us have done things even after receiving you that we regret. But Lord, I pray that you would, that, and Lord, I thank you, Father, that you're a God that continues to forgive. You continue to receive us again. Father, we give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor for what you have done for us. Lord, we thank you, Father, for Jesus Christ who came and suffered through all these things we talked about tonight. Lord, and suffered those things for us, that he became that suffering servant. Father, but I thank you tonight that he didn't stay on the cross and he certainly didn't stay in the grave, but he's risen again and he is exalted and his name is above every name, Lord, that one day that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. Lord, I pray that we'll bow to him now and not wait till then. We'll thank you, Father. We praise you. We give you glory. We give you honor for it. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless y'all. Have a good evening. We're here for you. We're praying for you. Continue to pray for us. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so.